Hi, in this video we're going to talk about integration by parts. As you know, when you're taking derivatives, there are rules. Linearity, the chain rule, the product rule. And slowly, we're building these rules up backwards for antiderivatives. Today we're going to do integration by parts, which is essentially the product rule translated into antiderivative notation. As we work through some examples, what you'll see is that integration by parts can allow us to not only take the antiderivative of two things that are multiplied together, but it can also help us do other things like take the antiderivative of arctan or take the antiderivative of the ln function, which by the way, we haven't done so far. You may not have noticed at this point. If the derivative of f times g is equal to this formula, then the antiderivative of this formula is equal to f times g. Don't forget the plus c. Now, this is not the most helpful antiderivative formula because the antiderivative would have to look exactly like f prime g plus f g prime in order for us to use this formula. So we're going to try to move things around and make life a bit easier. Using properties of integrals, we can separate the left side into two antiderivatives. Now what I'm going to do is take one of these integrals and subtract it over to the other side of the equation. This is essentially the integration by parts formula. Now it's not that easy to remember in the current format, so we're going to introduce some extra letters, some extra notation in order to make this formula easier to remember. Our notation is to set u equal to f of x and dv equal to the derivative of the g function times dx. A little note about the u and the v, depending on your handwriting, u and v might kind of look similar to each other, please notice that every time I make a U, the U has a little tail on the bottom of the U, but the V's have little tails on the top. That's how you can tell the difference between my U and my V. I suggest you do the same in your notebook as you're taking notes for this video. Okay, so according to this notation, if U is equal to F of X, what is the derivative on both sides of that equation? That means that DU is equal to the derivative of F times DX. And if DV is equal to G prime DX, taking the antiderivative of that relationship gives v is equal to g of x. So now our integration by parts formula, here's the format that we usually use. The left side is the antiderivative, f is the u, times g prime dx is equal to dv in our new notation. This is the easy term, f is equal to u and g is equal to v. So the f times g term turns into u times v. And finally, don't forget we can multiply in any order, so if I do g first, g is equal to v, and f prime times dx is equal to du. Don't worry about the plus c. Notice there's an antiderivative symbol on both sides of this equation. So think about this. You're given an integral. That's this one on the left. Then you do integration by parts, and your new formula looks something like this on the right-hand side. Now you still have to do this integral of v times du. Hopefully this integral will be easier than the original integral. That's the whole point of the integration by parts formula. But after you do that integral, you will, of course, add plus c. So the extra plus c is extraneous. We don't need it. This is our integration by parts formula. It is the chain rule backwards. So let's talk about how can we make sure things will get easier when we use the integration by parts formula. Here's what I want to notice is that polynomials, when you take their derivatives, they get simpler and simpler. Polynomials have this really nice property where a fifth power decreases to a fourth power after I take the derivative. Take the derivative of that and I get a cubic. I take enough derivatives of polynomials, eventually I'll get zero. Polynomials get simpler when you take their derivatives. Sines, cosines, and exponentials do not get simpler upon differentiation. Just try a couple of examples here. If I start with sine, its derivative is cosine, and the derivative of that is negative sine. We're just going in circles here. How about exponentials? If I start with an exponential and take the derivative, I get another exponential. Take the derivative of that and it's another exponential. Again, we're just going in circles here. Exponentials give exponentials. Sines and cosines give sines and cosines. These functions do not get simpler when you differentiate them. Here's our first example. We're going to need that integration by parts formula. We've got two functions multiplied together, x squared and cosine. It's my job to decide which one is the u and which one is the dv. Now, after I make that decision, I'm going to still have 
have to do this other integral of v times du. So u and dv are my initial choices, but I'm gonna have to take the derivative of the u in order to get du. I sure hope that function gets simpler, and I'm gonna have to take the antiderivative of the dv in order to get v. Okay, so here's where the previous slide comes into play. I'm gonna make a choice to have x squared be in the u position. Polynomials should almost always be in the u position. Well, why is that? It's because after I take the derivative of polynomials, I get something that's simpler of a lower power. What's left over for the cosine must be my dv. It's the only choice left. And I take the antiderivative of dv in order to get v. Now that didn't get simpler, but that's okay. I just need the original problem, which is these two things multiplied together, the v and du as a quantity multiplied together. I need that to get simpler. That's the whole strategy behind integration by parts. Okay, let's actually do this. This integral is equal to u times v, u is x squared, v is sine x minus the integral of v times du. v is sine x and du is 2x x dx. We'll pull out that 2 and write the x in front of the sign. Okay, so this is improvement. We started with x squared times cosine, and after we implemented the integration by parts formula, now we have x times sine as the integral that needs to be done. That's actually an improvement. That's good. The integration by parts formula is making the problem simpler. But now we have a new problem. Let's focus on our new problem. Our problem has reduced down to the answer antiderivative of x times sine. Can anybody guess what we're going to do next? I hope that you guessed it. We're going to do integration by parts again. Integration by parts a second time will be very similar to the first one, except here u will be equal to just x. Taking the derivative of u, we get 1 times dx. The dv is the sine x dx. Taking the antiderivative of sine, we get negative cosine. Now inside these red parentheses, we're going to execute our second integration by parts formula. According to our formula, it's u times v, which is negative cosine, minus the integral of v times du, which is equal to dx. Here's where we finally see it working. This is the antiderivative of negative cosine. That's the most reasonable problem you could ever hope for. So let's do it and finish this thing. Of course, as I go along, I'm just going to simplify things and make it look nicer for myself. Let's just put those minuses together for now, and on the final line, we'll finish the problem. Taking the antiderivative of cosine, we get sine, and finally, don't forget to add plus c. There we go. That's our answer down at the bottom of the slide here. That is a really long formula, but remember that in calculus too, you can always take the derivative of your answer here and you should get the original problem. What happens is that if you take the derivative of your answer, like in order to check and make sure things are working, the derivative of this term requires the product rule. The derivative of this term also requires the product rule. If you actually write all that stuff out, a bunch of stuff will cancel out and the only thing left over will be x squared times cosine. So it turns out that the derivative of this big long quantity is x squared times cosine. All right, here's our next example. We're going to apply the integration by parts formula, and similar to the previous problem, the way we do it is by figuring out which one of these functions, x squared and ln of x, is equal to u, and which one's equal to dv. That's how you start every integration by parts formula. u is equal to something, and dv is equal to something. And you stare at the original problem and decide which is which. Suppose that I put the ln function in for the dv. Unfortunately, there's a problem here. What's the antiderivative of the ln function? I hope that you're stumped by that because we don't know the answer to that problem. Unfortunately, we haven't learned that yet. Of course, you know the derivative of the ln function, but you don't know the antiderivative. Oh man, so this is not going to work, unfortunately. We have to choose our u and our dv somehow differently. So, I don't know, let's just switch them and see what happens. Let's have the dv be the x squared, because we don't have any other choice, and the u be the ln function. At least this way, it's possible to continue with the problem. Taking the derivative of u in order to get du, we get 1 over x times times dx, taking the antiderivative of dv in order to get v, one-third x cubed. From the original problem on the top 
line. It should be the case that when we multiply these two things on the bottom, it should be simpler than the original problem. Is it? Does it work? And here, the secret is multiplication. Look, if I multiply the du times the v, the du is 1 over x, and the v is 1 third x cubed. When I multiply those guys together, I get 1 third x squared. Oh, that is simpler than the original problem. Okay, so let's see this really written out. Doing the integration by parts formula, I get u times v, so ln times third x cubed minus the integral of v, v is a third x cubed, times du. du is 1 over x dx. Move things around because I like things to look nice. Take out a constant because I like things to be simple. And here's the trick. Is x cubed times 1 over x is actually just x squared. So if you compare the original problem with the integral that we have to do after the integration by parts formula, yeah, that is simpler. The original problem was x squared ln, and what we're going to do is just x squared. So it looks like we're making progress. Finishing the problem here is really not too bad. Take the antiderivative of x squared, and don't forget the plus c. And here we learn an important lesson about the correct choices to make for integration by parts. On example number one, we saw that u is often equal to the polynomial because polynomials get simpler when you differentiate them. However, if I put u equal to the polynomial in this problem, then the dv will be equal to the ln and then I won't be able to take the antiderivative of the ln because we don't know what the antiderivative of ln is. So here I'm just stuck. There's just nothing else I can do other than putting the u as the ln and the polynomial as the dv. I carry out the problem and I find that that actually works. Works. Hey everyone, we're taking a brief intermission so that I can let you know what's up with integration by parts. The two problems that we just covered are the main bulk of integration by parts, and that's what you really, really need to know solid, solid before you come to class. I just want you to know that the next example is a little bit exotic. It might seem like an intimidating problem, but if you have a lot of questions about problem number three, don't worry about it. We will talk about it in class, and we'll do another example in class. So here's problem number number three. It's the antiderivative of e to the x times cosine of x. Now the reason why this problem is hard is because e to the x doesn't get simpler when you differentiate it and neither does cosine. That just turns into a sine. So this problem, it's going to feel like we're just going in circles. All right, so let's get started. We're going to choose our u and our dv. Now the initial choice that you make, because neither of them gets simpler when you differentiate it, it actually doesn't matter which one we choose. Let's just say e is the u and cosine dx is the dv. We take the derivative here in order to obtain the du. We take the antiderivative here in order to obtain the v. And there's our dictionary. This will be integration by parts number one that we're doing for this problem. Doing the integration by parts formula, I get u, which is e, times v, which is sine, minus the integral of v du. That's left over here. We're going to do integration by parts on this integral. We will choose similar to the first integration by parts with u equals e to the x, except now the dv is the sine, taking the derivative and the antiderivative in order to get du and v. Now inside these red big square parentheses, we're going to do our second integration by parts minus the integral of v times du. We started with e to the x cosine. We did integration by parts once. We got e to the x times sine. Then we did integration by parts again, and we're left with the integral of e to the x cosine. And this really seems circular. We're just going from the original problem. We got the original problem back. Even though this feels circular, it's actually right on track. And the key here is to make a summarizing statement. This is the whole trick to the problem. The original problem is equal to our circled statement right here. Now I've got a couple of minus signs hanging around. Let me just clean things up here in terms of the minus signs. Okay, so here's what we've got from our summary equation. Now, all I'm doing here is I'm just cleaning up my summary equation. I'm going to distribute the minus sign inside the red parentheses. And here's where we're almost finished with the problem. Now, the fact that the integral that I'm looking for appears in two different places means that I want to consolidate these two integrals into just one on one side of the equation. So it'll be different for every single problem. But for this one, I'm going to move this over to the other side of the equation. So here, I'm going to be adding 
the integral of e to the x cosine of x dx to both sides of the equation. What happens when I do that? On the left side, that means I get two of them. And I got this stuff, which is part of my formula. And finally, the last term on the end here cancels out. That's the whole trick. The last thing we gotta do is divide by two on both sides. So our final answer is one half times the quantity e to the x sine plus e to the x cosine. Don't forget the plus c. The whole trick to this type of a problem where nothing gets simpler, you're just going in circles, is to make a summary equation. That's the whole key to this problem. And then add something to both sides in order to consolidate the integrals on one side of the equation. That's the whole trick. This is not something that we're going to do every day in class for every integration by parts problem. This is an exotic sort of extra problem that's a little bit challenging that I hope you'll challenge yourself to really master. But remember that problems number one and problems number two are the main focus for integration by parts. I hope you enjoyed this video on integration by parts. Remember, integration by parts is essentially the product ruled backwards. I know you'll be starting the homework super early this week because you're excited about integration by parts, and we'll see you soon.